Hi, and welcome to today's webcast with Robert Curry, myself, and Sarah Gonzalez. Great to have you here, Sarah. Hi, <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, um, so guys, today we've got a very, very exciting schedule. We're going to be talking about webcasts, webinars, the difference between all of those kind of things. And what the best thing to do is, is to ask questions through the bottom right-hand corner. So I believe there's a tab on yes. down the bottom where you can click on ask a question. Any questions that you have coming through, we can check them as we go. And we're very, very happy to answer them as we go along. So the other thing we want you to do is also to complete a survey form at the end of the presentation. So that will be um, coming to at the end as well. Yep. Um, so basically, Sarah, we've got so many different names for these different types of applications. You yes. know, webcast, webinar, um, you know, live streaming, that kind of thing. What's the difference and what does all that lingo mean? Yeah, so I really want to break through the jargon um, just to kick this off and get mm -hmm. right into it, Rob, because you know as well as I do, you get invitations to all of these different online events and sometimes it's like, well, what's the difference? What does it all mean? So here's a snapshot of the three types of events that we most commonly hear. So let's start mm -hmm. with webinar and I think we've all heard of webinars. We've all mm -hmm. either attended one of them or even presented on one of them. And a webinar really is a one-to-many experience. So with this, you've got a presenter, they're in front of a uh, computer usually um, and a lot of the time if you've ever been on a web conference or anything like that it is the same platform um, it's just one to many not really collaborative so mm -hmm. the PowerPoint is really king in this sort of environment and you might have a webcam on there um, a lot of people will keep the webcam up for the entirety of the presentation or mm -hmm. you may just have it up for the intro and then also for Q&A at the end or you may have no webcam at all. Then you go into a studio webcast, which is mm. exactly what we're doing here now. So These it's are pretty almost, fancy. Yeah, they are. It's like a step up from a webinar, and it's like, oh, let's get, you know, take it up. Gold standard, people call the webcasting. I feel like an important TV presenter or something like that. It, do, it does feel like yep. that. Um, and that's why your presenter is really important mm. if you do want to do something like this. So with this, it's high definition video. So it's not just a webcam. You can see the focus of what we're doing now is us, but we do have a PowerPoint alongside us. Sometimes you may not have a PowerPoint at all, and it can mm. just be like online TV, if you like. Um, so with here, it really is about the video being king as opposed to the PowerPoint. Um, these are great for panel discussions or interviews like we're doing now so you might have an expert of you know for example if you're in the mental health space and you run webinars once a month maybe every third month you might want to have a panel of experts within the mental health space that are talking about something that's really really topical mm -hmm. um, and then you've also got the hybrid webcast so with this think of a live a conference that you attend face to face um, and they're all coming up now I know we've got yeah. a few on over the next few weeks and you're in that environment but then you can also watch it at home if you like as well so mm. it's live streaming or streaming speakers from the United States into a conference a Wagga Wagga for example so yeah. anything like that and that's where you hear the term live streaming well because I always want to attend these big conferences in the yeah. US especially like New York yes. and I mean it's a day of travel to get there yeah, this way um, exactly yeah, and so. I think people find that with their presenters as well now um, and the in the US live streaming is very popular most people I think it's around 90% of organizations in the US if they do host a live conference, they will actually stream it as well mm. because they know the value that they get out of it and they can reach people all over the world. And so what's the best, um, so if you look at like a webinar versus a webcast, mm. when's it best to use either one of them? I think it depends on your topic and your presenter and what you're trying to achieve. And I think anyone going into an online event, first of all, needs to think of their goal and what they mm. want to achieve. Is it lead generation? Is it education? Is it some sort of engagement where you want to have a full-on discussion with people through the chat box, like we're encouraging people to do now? Mm -hmm. And I think a webinar, like I said, it's really about the PowerPoint and getting mm -hmm. that out there. And if I am a, web, a webinar organiser, I want people to be watching the PowerPoint, um, pro um, professional development and that yeah. sort of stuff where people want to learn. Whereas if you want to have a discussion and you want to engage and you've got, um, like I said, a, a subject matter expert mm -hmm. who's great and really engaging and you think that them as a presenter is really going to make the session, that's when you would use a webcast. Yeah, and I feel like webcast is more of a, um, you know, you're making a more serious investment in your oh. business when you're doing webcast. Yes, definitely. Yeah, like a webinar, I mean, you can go on a laptop anywhere around the yeah. world and kind of log it on, and, yeah. and which is a good thing. I mean, when you're doing a webcast, it means you need to be more prepared, um, you know, more focused and, mm. and a lot more production value with it. Yeah, definitely. And you can mm. see um, we've got a green screen here today as well. Um, so you could put anything behind us if you wanted to. You could have a panel desk, you could have lounges, much more engaging for your audience. Yeah, and so you've done um, 
you've been doing this for a while now. Mm. What are you seeing as the latest trends in the industry with these different platforms? Um, I think there's three different things, and you can see that on the slide now. Mm. So um, I think one of the things you really need to consider is a series or a program. I think if you go out and you just want to run a webinar or a webcast, you might not see your return on investment as much as putting together a program, figuring out what your audience wants, what your goals are, putting together a program, and then you know saying this is the content that I want to deliver. Here's where I want to run some webinars because these presenters are based in different locations and maybe they can't get to a studio. Here's where I want to put a webcast because, you know, it's our conference at the end of the year and we really want to promote that beforehand. So thinking about your series as a whole, um, that's what people are starting to do now as opposed to these one-off events. Um, and the length. It's getting mm. shorter and shorter and shorter. And I think, you know, you're asking people to invest time in these events, especially if they are free. And a lot of the time, you know, we talk about saturation and webinars. Are, how many webinar invitations do you get a week? Oh, from? especially like in the marketing <laughs> yes. space, you know, every day. You know, yeah, every attend week. this webinar and it will change your life. And they yeah. promise so much. And then you get on and you can't even hear the audio properly. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm finding, um, you know, in our space, in the marketing space, there's... Um, yeah, people are really sick of getting pitched to yes. on these types of platforms. Yes. So that they'll get on, there's absolutely no value. And that's where your presenter comes in here. Um, yeah. You really need to be careful mm. on who you pick because a lot of presenters, mm. you're right, they get on there and it's like, oh, here's your free set of steak knives. You <laughs> just That's all they're doing and it's like, no, guys, this is educational and if you want to alienate your audience, and that's a perfect way to do it. <laughs> yeah, and the sad thing is like, you only get away with that once yeah. because once people have seen that, they're like, that's it, that's blacklisted, I'll never go on that guy's webinar again, it's and kind of finished. That's it. And I think it's a lot easier for people to shut down their computer as opposed to walk out of a room. Mm. So these days you really need to capture people within the first 30 seconds of what you're doing. Um, and then also, like we'll just say in the length. So I would say in the past, we always had the 60 minute webinar, the lunch and learn, mm. get online and your lunch break. Whereas now it's like, do you know what? 60 minutes is a long time. Um, I'd say half an hour and then maybe 45, um, 15 minutes for Q&A, which will go into a 45-minute session. Agreed. Well, I mean, you know, an hour is a long time to commit now. Mm. You know, an hour out of someone's time is a lot. Yes. And so, yeah, like if it's going to be an hour, it needs to be good. Yeah, it needs to be amazing, <laughs> and it does yeah. need to change your life. Um, but I think also a lot of people are doing on-demand content as well. Mm. So that's, you know, creating stuff um, live, but then chopping it up into little segments and maybe doing um, a 15-minute on-demand webcast. So what we're doing now, and then we could have planned this so that we would have access to it on demand, which everyone will, but we could easily chop it up into maybe 10-minute segments and then send that to people out afterwards. So you're sending maybe once a week, and a good way to think of this um, is implement it into your content marketing plan as well. So throughout the week, um, throughout the year, we send a blog every Friday. Mm. Sometimes what we'll do, we'll do a 45 minute um, webcast that's not necessarily live, it's just pre-recorded. So it's pre-recorded content. And mm. then we'll actually send that through the blog once a week in 10 minute chunks. Yeah, so you've got, you've got potentially um, mm -hmm. six weeks there of content. Yeah. That's yep. great, just from one webcast. Yes, yeah, just yeah, from fantastic. one event. So that's where you really need to start thinking of your return on investment as well. And it's not just how many people are going to attend on the day and how much mm. money you could make if you are charging, um, because a lot of people are starting to charge now. Mm. People are really starting to say, okay, what am I going to do with this after the fact? And how can I even gain more from that as well? So that's another trend we're really starting to see. Yeah, and I'm, I'm starting to see the trend, like you mentioned, of people charging mm. because n you would never ever charge for webinar before oh, or webcast. But definitely. But now, it, now it's kind of shifting to like, you know what, this is valuable content and you're going to learn. And yeah. if you came to a seminar, you would pay to come to a seminar. Yeah. So we're treating this exactly the same way. Exactly. And I think if you do have a really highly engaged audience and you are giving them this free content and they are attending your webinars and you're getting great feedback and you're measuring the feedback through surveys and stuff like that, once you've got that audience, you can charge maybe once every third or fourth webinar because they they do believe in you and they do believe that you deliver good content and people are willing to pay. Well, what I found is that um, running like other seminars or webinars, when people pay, they pay mm. attention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you get a much higher quality of attendance. Yeah. And that's another trend, Rob. Mm -hmm. So attendance rates, and I would say to everyone out there looking to run an online event, no matter which style, don't be disheartened by those people joining. And I want to mm. quiz you on this because you've got um, a lot of um, experience in this area. But we're starting to see probably a 40% attendance rate on average with yeah. free events. And do you know what? 
you've got those people who want to attend live, but people want stuff on demand when they want it. Like you think of Netflix and those sort of things, and I want to watch it when I want. You, who are you to dictate to me when I should sit down and watch you? Very true. Yeah. And actually, forty percent isn't bad. No, it isn't bad at all. No, you know, because considering that it's free and it's so easy for something else to pop up. Yes. And so that's actually not a bad result at all. And then, so once that's done, make sure you do send out the recording to everyone who registered, and then those people who are watching in their own time are going to be a lot more engaged because they're choosing when to watch mm. and you've actually captured those people in a time that's convenient for them and you know we speak that's one trend this year but next year what we're even going to start doing is when we um, have a registration page out we're going to give people the option to register for the live or register for the on-demand yeah. and we would never have done that two years ago because yeah. we're like oh we want everyone to attend yeah. live we need that engagement that's how we're going to measure our investment but really you want to give you need to think about the person who's joining and you need to think about the ease for them and the convenience for them. And it depends on what time zone they're in as well. Mm. So I know with my community, they're all around the world. Yeah. And so, you know, like we try and do mornings which mm. is, um, of Australian time, which is kind of okay, but even still, like, the UK doesn't like that. Yes, You know, exactly. if it's late night in the UK, it's not too bad for the US, but it's very hard to get one single time that works for all the different time mm. zones. And what are your thoughts on attendance? Because you almost broke the record, didn't you? Yeah, Let's we talk did really about well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's worked really well for us is a number of things. Um, to, to get more attendance mm. to start with is um, actually running advertisements okay. to, to the webinar mm. or, or to the webcast. And so by doing that, um, we're... Like, we're not just using... A lot of people just rely on their own database. Mm. They might send an email. Yes. Um, and that's all well and good, but that's only one way of getting people to come. Mm. And so we've used um, advertisements very successfully going directly to that landing page yeah. um, for people to register. So when we last broke the world record, we had half of the registrations coming from email marketing, mm -hmm. just emailing to the database, and the other half actually came from Facebook ads. Ah, okay, there you yeah, go. So and you can target that. and segment quite heavily on Very Facebook, good. can't you, as well? Yeah, like a lot of people say, oh, we're B2B, Facebook mm. doesn't work, but actually it does. Mm. Well, it everyone's does. person at the end of the day, and I think most people use Facebook, so... People on Facebook all the time. Yeah. You know, even when you're at work, people are checking on their phones, and mm. so it's... They're using Facebook all the time, and we're finding it's a very, very good traffic source for us. And have you used um, LinkedIn sponsored ads as well? Um, we have. We find them very, very expensive. Mm. Yeah, at this stage, so I, I do believe they are working on the platform to make it a bit more um, user friendly mm. and and to be able to get better rates from it. But right now, it's prohibitively expensive for a yeah. webinar. Like it might cost you a few dollars a click, mm. and you know, so um, it's going to be very expensive to get someone on a webinar through mm. LinkedIn ads. And are those people um, that you are getting from um, this paid advertising? Mm. Once they're in the webinar, are they converting? Yeah, they are. Yeah. So we're finding they convert just the same as a normal, mm. um, regular subscriber, which is fantastic. Yep. I think that the important thing is really to have um, the messaging very clear on that landing page. Yes. You know, like, so people know exactly what they're getting. Mm. Um, and then also what we do is we normally send out um, a few emails before the webinar starts. Mm. So um, not just saying, hey, don't forget about the webinar. It's more like telling stories, mm. um, you know, sharing a bit of content mm. so that the new people, because they've never heard about this before. True, yeah. Yeah, just to get it's a bit, first bit more point, familiar. It's their first touch and, you know, that ties in nicely to what we've got here, which is um, looking at pre-production and setting everything up and creating your registration pages. And I think um, having them aligned to your branding is really important, having these registration pages or the emails that you're doing. Um, and, you know, if we look at before your event, you've got your email, you've got people register, you have an autoresponder, you might have a last chance to register, yeah. then a reminder email. Like, it is a lot to set up as well. So it you is. want to try and put as much information in those sort of pieces of um, pieces of content as possible, don't you? Yeah, and the thing is, um, it might feel like you're sending a lot of emails, mm. but the thing, like people don't normally say, "Oh, hang, on, hang mm. on, why did you send me so many emails for?" Like it yeah. just, it's kind of expected, and quite often people might not even see the first email just because everyone gets so yes. many emails these days. So there is really no harm in sending a couple of emails about each specific event that you're running. Yeah. yeah even though people feel like, oh, we sent an email, don't send any more. Yeah. It's like, you know what, maybe send a couple. And we find with, obviously, um, this might be common sense to some people, but if you are sending a last chance to register email, then don't send it to the people who have already registered. Yeah, that's don't a good one. Don't bombard those guys. Yeah. You sort of want to send different content, don't you, like you said. So if you do have maybe 40 people register for the first event that you're running, um, maybe Maybe between that time period. So we don't usually send out webinar or webcast invitations until one or two weeks beforehand. Mm. So once they do register, you've then got permission, like you said, to send them more, maybe one or two emails, talking about what the webinar is going to be like, asking people to submit questions beforehand. Yeah, well, the thing is, um, it's... Uh, yeah, you don't want... That'd be about the maximum mm. of, of time that you give because with these webcasts and, and webinars, 
if you give too much notice, people forget about it yes. when it gets too close. So Definitely. it's not like a big event where they have to get mm. travel expenses and things like yeah. that. So these are much better to have a shorter time frame mm. and, and make it a lot faster like that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think, you know, marketing has to be done one, two max weeks mm. beforehand. Um, and you need to try and create that urgency with people as well. And you will actually see an increase in your registrations if you start to take on that method. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so also here as well, um, just in terms of pre-production and planning for your event, um, you've got your email marketing, your topics, your times. Um, obviously, we know you need to make your topics quite catchy um, mm. and understand your audience before you, you are sending out those invitations. Um, but I also think it's important at this stage to align your presentation with your presenter and the reason I say this is we've had um, experiences before and I'll tell one short story um, of a time when we had probably like three or four hundred registrations on a partner webinar and they got on and they were just abusing the presenter and the presenter <laughs> wasn't talking about anything that was advertised so they had a webinar organizer within mm. the organization who put together this email and this branded page and she even had the learning level there as um, advanced and this presenter got on and he was talking mm. about something completely different because he wasn't aligned with the content oh, so no. I think what it was, yeah I know and this poor guy was online and I think a lot of the time organizations go out there they get excited they put together a plan they're like oh you can present this um, without actually pulling everything together and making sure that it's actually a package for people so then when they do get online it's like I know what I've registered for I know what I'm going to take away what learnings I'm going to get out of it so what's the presenter going to talk about <laughs> well like we were saying like it's so important to have those expectations correct mm. yeah um, and that's that's going to help with conversion as well because yes. at the end of the day if people you know if they know what they're signing up for they turn up they get what they expected yes um, yeah there's a, there's a good chance that they're going to do more business with your company yes exactly yeah. and like we said earlier um, you know we run the Redback report um, on an annual basis and we'll be doing that in February so we go out there and get people's feedback on their experiences um, and so many people said so the number one thing when it comes to a presenter is them getting online and being salesy or talking too much about themselves yeah. is one way for them to log off. Yeah, straight yeah. away. <laughs> yeah, Because yeah. I, I mean, some way I actually log on to and like the 20 minutes where the person tells their whole life story. Oh, I know. And it's like, well, I know who you are. I probably stalked you on LinkedIn before we got on here. Yeah, so. people wouldn't sign up if they didn't yeah. know who the person was. So then that, that's a waste of 20 minutes. Yes. And then there might be like 15 minutes of content and then probably half an hour of pitch. Yeah. It's like, come on. Yeah. Like, you know, that's an hour of my life. I won't get back ever again. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we have spoken about marketing, um, but I think we should speak a little bit um, just quickly about the marketing plans yeah, and how you need to build and nurture those people as opposed to just sending them an email for every single webinar. It's like, what are you doing in between that phase? Hmm. So with our business, we try and... Um like we, we really want to make sure that we're not just sending people um, invitations yes. and stuff all the time. Yes. And so sometimes we'll even send um, just an email with some tips, but mm. not have a call to action, mm. which is, um, you know, like if you go back five or ten years, that was like a no-no. Yeah, so yeah. always have a call to action to yeah, every email. Yeah. But we're finding now that it builds a lot of trust if you mm. just send emails without always asking for something in return. Yep. And then when you do, it's kind of like... Um, that, that Gary Vaynerchuk book, you know, like jab, jab, then a right hook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a few more jabs in there yeah. and um, rather, than, rather than just going for the right hook all the time and asking for the call to action. Yeah. So we found that's been quite effective um, with open rates and with engagement with our audience mm. rather than just pitching every single time. Yeah. And mm. I think um, for these webinars, what you'll actually find when you do sort out a program, you'll build this network and this community and people online start to get to know each other. They type in questions as well and they start chatting to one, to one another and we've been running our business skills series um, for four and a half years now mm -hmm. and people who were on the first webinar still attend to this day and they don't attend everything but we're constantly sending them guides and emails and um, like you said tips and white papers in between that time so we're not just sending them webinar invitations, we're nurturing them through so they can actually be part of our, what we're trying to achieve which is our online amazing community. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is people like to consume it in different content. Yes. So sometimes like I haven't got time to watch a whole one hour webinar, but yes. I'd like to watch like a five minute, you know, like read yes. the five minute PDF summary. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like 
to get the most engagement. Like if you find that your audience is sitting there watching mm. the whole webinar for the hour yep. or the half an hour, that, that's the best form of engagement you can get. Yeah, I agree, mm. definitely. Um, so here are some tips and we will be sending a copy of the slides and the recording within the week. Um, but also if you go down to the resources folder um, on the bottom right hand corner, you'll see a link there to the Redback Inspiration Hub. So if you click there, you can actually go and download that Redback report that we were just speaking about, as well as some other guys on how to host your events. And I think there's one um, particular to marketing in there as well. So, you know, if we look at this as a whole, Rob, um, it's quite standard for any sort of marketing um, event. You've got your passive marketing, so maybe using your social media pages um, really passively on your website. Mm -hmm. A lot of people um, I'm seeing now actually have a page dedicated to webinars on their website, upcoming yeah. events, which yeah. is good. That's a great thing because um, you just don't know what people are interested in. Yeah. And having those different topics really helps you segment, okay, what are people interested in? Like we might run one on public relations mm. um, and that gets a completely different audience if we want to run on LinkedIn marketing. Yes. So it's we're finding that just very different topics are attracting different, different um, segments of our community. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and then once you've got that, you might have that one month beforehand in the background. I think email signatures are a great way to advertise this. We change ours every single month depending on what we're promoting mm. and a lot of the times it is webinars. That's a great tip. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good just to have a link and then people, how many emails do you send oh, a day? We send 50, 100 <laughs> yeah. emails. You know, every person on our team is doing that. So, yeah. yeah, having that would be um, yeah. a great way of getting more sign-ups. Yeah, Definitely. That's smart play. Um, and then you've got the social marketing, which you were talking about. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about remarketing mm. when you're running online events and how that's worked for you? Yes, yeah, so that's worked really well. So what we find is that quite often people might click on the link to register mm. for the webinar and for whatever reason they just don't register, mm. you know. So there's always like you never get a 100% opt-in rate. So yeah. it just doesn't work, the world doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know, if you're doing well, you might get 50, 60, yeah. 70. And so those other people, what we normally do is have a remarketing, it's called a pixel, I'm not sure um, the, um, if people have heard of that before, but we put a, a remarketing pixel mm -hmm. on that landing page. And so if people don't register, then we kind of stalk them around the internet mm. and um, try and get them to register at a later stage. Yeah, and I've, I'm sure many people have been on there searching a holiday or something, then all of a sudden, when you're online, you see all these ads for holiday destinations. It's like, yeah. oh, how clever. It's, well, no. it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not a coincidence, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so that's, um, that's been very, very effective for us. We mm. find that uh, remarketing and retargeting is quite often um, the lowest cost form of advertising mm -hmm. that you can use because people have already seen your brand yes. and so then it, it's a lot less expensive to get them to come back mm. and to register at a later stage. Yep. So that's worked really well for us. Yeah, and um, and the, the retargeting is very good because now it, it can be on the Google Display Network, mm -hmm. which is um, millions and millions of websites around the world, but also um, the Facebook platform has yes, retargeting built into it. it. Does, so yeah. it's very good. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, if you are launched into these types of events, don't neglect your social, the social side of things. Mm. Um, but I think if people don't actually have a social presence online, is this something to start with? Is this a way for them to get in there and test the waters with yeah. social marketing? Yeah, well, I, I believe just advertise. Mm. I mean, even if you haven't got a good presence, mm. you, can, you can set up a page in five minutes you and don't you can advertise. Yeah, yeah so okay. you don't need to have a million fans to yeah. make this work. You can have no fans. Yeah. Um, and just run ads, mm. which is fantastic. You know, okay. um, you've never been able to do it before. You always had to build up a following yeah. and then advertise the That's following. That's what I think most people would assume, wouldn't they? That you yeah. have to be, have this amazing online presence before you actually do this, but you don't. No, just run ads. Yeah, just run them. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Put the credit um, card. Yeah, and then we talk about direct marketing, which we spoke about those emails beforehand and nurturing your community. Um, now, I just want to go quickly into live production mm. um, before we get to the Q&A and speaking about how to measure your return investment um, and I think everyone needs to get familiar with the platform that they're using even as an organizer and these platforms you don't have to be really tech savvy you don't need to be a CTO to be able to operate um, these types of platforms they're meant to be easy there are a lot of platforms out there that don't even have software so you don't have to download anything and your attendees don't have to download anything. That's even better like oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those ones we have to download software and plugins. Yes and, oh, I know. Yeah. Can get a lot crazy. of support questions for those. Yes yeah. um, but you know I think it's um, really, really important to understand the platform and what you're working with before you start to work with your presenter and mm. build your content and your format because there's so many things that you can do in a platform. If you look at a webinar platform, you've probably got about 
15, 16 different features you can use. Mm -hmm. And most webinars I run, we probably use two of the features. We use a slideshow and we use a survey and yep. the chat box. So there's three. <laughs> and that's about, you know, for 99% of the time, mm. that's all you need. Now, yep. it's good to have those features, don't yes. get me wrong, but most of the time, if you just get the basics right, yes. um, like they say in football, you know, be brilliant on the basics. Yeah, yeah. and don't try and be too fancy um, mm. because you need to think of it from your participants' experience. And it's easy to be online and present and be like, oh, I want to use this, this, and this. But then, well, as a participant, and well, you just mentioned that, you know, people learn in different ways, and some people um, are really visual and some people are really audio. And as a participant, I'm watching your slides, I'm reading your slides, I'm typing in the chat box, I'm seeing what other people are doing in the chat box. I might, you might have a webcam, so I'm seeing a visual of you, and I'm listening to you. And that's a lot to have to do for someone on the other end. Oh, yeah. And if you try and get too fancy with two, like, polling for example so you yeah. can actually poll your audience on all of these platforms if you do 20 polls through a webinar people are just going to get over it <laughs> oh you know one or two is plenty it has to yeah. be relevant doesn't it that's right and i feel that um you can overdo the technology it's like oh this is a cool little feature yes. this is a shiny new object yes. but it's like you know what have a good message present the message well yes use the relevant features to make it um enhance it but yeah the main thing is that message. Yeah. yeah, and I think one important thing, um, if you do take away from here and you are going into this sort of um, this sort of these sort of platforms, is to try and use in-room surveys. So a few platforms out there have an in-room survey. So mm. it's collecting feedback from your audience, and then obviously tailoring your programs moving forward and getting that feedback. Um, if you run a, a webinar or a webcast and you send an email afterwards with a link to a survey, you're not going to get a great response rate. You can actually mm. have the survey built inside the platform. So while people are in there, they can actually fill out the survey and you get those responses immediately. So yeah. I think that's really important to collect that feedback but mm -hmm. make sure you do something with it. <laughs> yeah, well, like you mentioned, we've been on this for four years now. Yeah. So it's, um, and make sure you guys uh, fill out the feedback form at the end yeah. of this as well. <laughs> so that's, that's very important. That's a nice little segue. Yeah, and uh, the thing is, it's, um, like, it's important to have that feedback mm. because you, know, you might just run these and then over time, less and less people attend mm. or they're, they're engaging less. But if you didn't have those survey questions, you wouldn't know why. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know, know why do not. So yeah. it's just like, what's going on with these stats? Mm. And then it's too late because yep. they've lost the engagement. Exactly. So, yeah, survey all the way through. And um, post-production as well. So, you know, what's happened after? Once you click end, mm. it's not over. If anything, it's almost just beginning. Um, so, you know, think about editing and your on-demand requirements. Are you going to send this out to people? Um, if you're online and you say to people, we're going to send this out in 48 hours, send it out in 48 hours. Um, think about your call to action, your debriefs with your presenter, um, trying to tweak your whole program and refine it as you move forward as well. So definitely, definitely look at the reports, analyze the data. You, you can get reports on who attended, how long mm -hmm. they were on for, how many registered, obviously through your registration, the Q&A transcript, that sort of stuff. So you've very got all that data. Very valuable data. Yeah. It's very, very valuable. And what we find is that, um, the other thing is, if you make, so like we do webinars in the consumer mm. space, so I'm um, like in the health market, nutrition, mm. um, those kind of markets, but we also do them in the business to business space. Mm. And quite often in the health space, we may have like a, a special webinar offer, but while the webinar is going on, mm. or like it expires one hour after the webinar finishes. And the thing is, invariably we'll get people that missed out on that and yes. said, hey, can we get that one hour special yeah. or can we get that webinar special? Yeah. And the answer is always no mm. um, because that was what the special was. Mm. And I believe that if you, um, like whatever you promise in the webinar or whatever you promise, mm. anything that you do, you need to fulfill that and you need to be in integrity because uh, the word gets out, yes. you know, and then that, then they realise, oh, that's not really a one hour offer. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we can get that any time. Don't worry about that. And you become mm. less trustworthy, don't you? It is. Yeah. Yep. So you might have a few unhappy customers mm. if you make an offer during the webinar or like there's something on that's live, um, but you can't do that for the replay mm. people. But it's just the way the world works. So uh, yeah. someone's going to be upset somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, before um, we get into the Q&A, I just want to quickly touch on presenters because I mm. think this is one of the most important things um, within your series. And I, it took me a while to realise this when I was working with presenters. Um, but, you know, one of the things that does come that does come out through the Redback Report is, you know, your presenter can be as knowledgeable as anyone and they could be amazing in what they do. But if they don't have that passion and enthusiasm and they can't break through that technology, mm. you're going to lose people. And for everyone out there, it's important to remember that presenting online is a completely different experience to presenting face-to-face, -face, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very different.
different because, I mean, you're not getting the audience feedback. Yes. If you're presenting, like, you know, yesterday I was speaking to an audience of 100 people yeah. and it's like you can see the looks on their you faces. You can see that body language as well, can't yeah, you? Yeah, you can adjust and yep. you can measure it. Um, with this, it's a bit different. Yeah. You know, you're talking to a, a camera. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> and it's very different. It's, it's good for us because we have that, that engagement between us and that mm. feedback. But most times, especially on a webinar platform, you actually got people sitting there looking at themselves on a webcam half the time. And so people come to us and say, oh, I've got this amazing presenter. They, you know, speak to over 500 people on a regular basis. They're going to be amazing. It's like, well, they sit behind the webcam and they just freeze. And yeah. quickly, I'll tell you a little story about this event I actually ran yesterday and did the training with this presenter. Um, he was in, he was a baby boomer, so he mm -hmm. wasn't really used to technology, had never been in a webinar platform before, mm -hmm. was, you know, for two days after the webinar, um, the presenter training, he was asking me all these questions and I'm like, oh. But he actually asked me, he said, what makes a good presenter? And I said, you know what, just be yourself. Don't be too formal. Work together with me as your facilitator as well and try and leverage me and use me as much as possible and try and engage with me and show some passion and enthusiasm. People get on there and be way too formal and stiff and that just really removes, it even in, it increases that technology barrier. Yeah, and it's kind of, it sounds obvious, doesn't yeah. it? Like be yourself, but most people don't be themselves. They, they kind of change. Yeah, and yeah. their voice, you need to realise that your voice needs to change in the way you present because people are listening and they're just not going to, they can't see your body language um, in a webinar environment with this it's a bit different so anyway Rob mm. this guy was amazing he was so good and he was just the way he, he was telling old stories as well mm. and I think storytelling is really important it was like war stories almost and the topic mm. was negotiation so he had all these funny stories that oh, he had some fantastic oh, stories and he's been working in it for like 30 years or something yeah. so he had some great stories about how he's worked all over the world and even how he um, had to negotiate for someone they wanted him to negotiate buying a Ferrari so those sort of stories that really engage people. And at the end, what you'll find is a lot of people um, after the Q&A, they'll say thank you, thank you in the chat box. And this one guy said, thank you so much. Your passion really shone through today's event. Isn't that great? And I'm like, that's what you want. You want someone passionate. He was talking, as he was talking, he was mentioning my name as well. So mm. it'd be like, oh, so Sarah, we're going to go into this part then. And everything he did was just spot on. And he, he was so nervous beforehand. He'd never used it before. But because he got on there and he knew what he was was talking about and he was passionate it just works so well yeah and even if you are nervous like quite often um if you just put yourself out there and just be, do just it try and do it <laughs> yeah. you know um the first time might be a bit nervous but yeah. each time it gets less and less exactly yeah um now before we um go on to q a is there mm -hmm. anything else that you want to cover off um and we do encourage people to ask questions now is the time guys yeah well i just think um what one more thing to do is to kind of get into it mm. you know give it a crack because i yep. mean it's all well and good to learn about it mm. and to um you know think that you're going to do it at some yes. stage but what i find is that um, the, the biggest enemy that people have is themselves, yes. you know, and, and trying to be perfect with everything. So you better off just having a crack, mm. you know, maybe your first one's not going to be perfect, it's the yes. way the world works, you know, and you'll keep getting better as time and time goes on. So have a go at it and, and see how you go with it. And when we send out this um, e email containing the recording of today's event, we'll also put some links. We've got um, Redback actually actually has some video training mod modules for your presenters that are free for anyone to access. So um, you can actually send these videos to your presenters if they're new or something like that. Um, but obviously training your presenters with one-on-one -on -one training. And a lot of webinar organisations out there actually offer the training. So they'll do a completely managed service. And you as the organiser, your job isn't to really know the technology and train your presenters, you need someone who's an expert in that field to actually do that, don't you? I agree. And I mean, if you're going to take this seriously as a mm. business model, I mean, if you're if you're using webinars and webcasts yep. as a way of generating business, well, you need to be serious about it. Yeah. You know, you need to um, train the presenter properly. You don't know, come, do it half. Don't do it halfway. Mm. Like, don't do it on a laptop with your, you know, your mic, you know, <laughs> like get a proper mic. Yeah, and yeah. Just do it. Like, it's not that expensive to do it properly. Yeah. And um, if you want to take it to the next level and do a webcast, come to a facility like this, mm. you know, and, and do it properly. Get Definitely. it. Just do a really good job because... If you do a half job, then it's well, what, what kind of brand do you want to put yourself out to be? Well, it is. It is your brand at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, webinars are a great way to get your brand out there and expose it. But it can be really, really good or really, really bad. And it's, mm. you're not going to get anyone in the middle. They're either going to love the experience or really not like it. So That's you right. do need to test the waters properly. Absolutely. Yeah. Great.
Um, okay, so um, what we're going to do now is just ask some questions. So um, Rob's actually got a little iPad where these okay. questions will come questions through. Questions have come through. This is exciting. Um, I've got one pre-question though. So Michelle actually submitted a question beforehand, and that's another great one to, another great way to create engagement and increase your attendees mm. by doing this and asking people to submit questions. So hopefully you're online now, Michelle. Yeah. Um, so, Michelle would like to explore the best option for the following scenario. Delivery of training courses where the presenter and most participants will be face-to-face -face in a metro location. However, a few participants are remotely located and want to dial into the training course with the ability to view the presentation material and interact, pose questions and offer comments. That's fantastic. And well, I, I mean, think that's a yeah, great way to get started. You're doing that way. hybrid event now. Yeah, so it looks like when we went through the three mm. different types of events at the start, it looks like that third one, the yeah. hybrid event, is a logical fit yeah. for, um, for Michelle. And I feel that um, you'd probably want someone like looking at those questions mm. that come through from the remote people because you want them to feel heard. Yes. You know, they, they need to feel a part of the conference. And even if the presenter asked questions of the remote audience mm. while he's in that presentation, just so they feel part of it all. Yeah. yeah, and I think having a facilitator is best. And Michelle, I think how you'd go about this, if you would just, depends on if you want um, people to be able to see what's happening in the room or mm. just hear and watch the presentation. So just remember, for any of these events, you've got three components. You've got the webcam, so the visual of the person, the listening, and then the PowerPoint as well. So if you did want that, you could have a camera set up in the room and that feed could go actually through the webinar platform. Platform. Otherwise, you simply set up a computer, you put the slide on there, and then you have a facilitator. So when you've got the people in the room actually presenting, the presenter who's presenting, they're actually just clicking the slides moving forward as well. And you can just have a basic people dial into a basic teleconference. So a lot of the times people fall over is because they don't have the right audio set up and yeah. the speakers and the VoIP and it's going over the internet. So if someone's internet drops out, you do have issues. Using a teleconference is a great way to eliminate that risk. Everyone knows how to use a telephone. Everyone um, can dial a telephone. Yeah, yeah. And you know, internet's not really where we want it to be for mm. these types of events. And if you are dealing people in uh, dealing with people in remote locations, um, which is what it seems like, then you just tell them to dial in, and then you've got your presenter speaking through um, a speakerphone. Definitely, yep. that's the way to do it. Great, good question. So we've got another question here from. Um, Sanjay, what's the future of podcasts? Mm. Yeah. Well, I think I think people are actually going back to podcasts. It's getting they more and more popular. It. Yeah. yeah, like especially in the last 12 months. Yeah. A lot of new podcasts starting up. And I think because people are doing it well now and they understand, um, you know, I personally use podcasts when I am traveling somewhere mm. and I want to listen. And I think, you know, one thing that's important to remember is accessibility with these types of things. Um, so you want your content to be accessible and I think that's where we talk about the on-demand. So yeah. you might want to run a series like this, but maybe you just want to hire out a studio for a day. Mm -hmm. You want to have all your presenters come in and you want to create 20 different events that run for 10 minutes and then host that all on-demand. Perfect. And that's like a podcast. Yeah, and, and then you, you can slice and dice it. Video. Yeah, yeah, and you, you can actually slice and dice all that content into podcasts. Yes. And that would be enough podcasts for months. Yeah. You know? So you can just do audio webcasts mm. if you like as well. So instead of people actually seeing us, they could just be listening to us as well. So there's so many different options. And um, it's, it's sort of like you need to go, you need to think of your wish list and what you want to achieve mm. and then go see an expert and they'll actually provide you because there's little pockets and all these sort of overlap mm. as well, all these different products they do they do and um, I mean podcasts you know you can do good stuff with them yes. um, you know I've got a friend in the US his name's John Lee Dumas he mm. runs um, Entrepreneur on Fire yep he gets a million, you know, he gets mm. a million downloads a month. And yep. he just, he runs out of his living room. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. You don't need, yeah. yeah. So you don't need to have, like, I mean, um, it's very accessible. And I mean, um, taking content like this, like through your mm. webinar and your webcast, slicing it up, putting it onto the podcast, yes. that's a great way of doing it. Yeah. And so I personally think they're coming back. So yeah. watch there you this go. space, Sanjay. Well, thank you, Sanjay. And we've got a question from Louise. So Louise um, asks, if it's a training course, how do you manage the audio when they start asking questions and having discussions? Mm. Good question. So um, a lot of the times with these types of events, uh, a webinar or webcast, if people are asking questions, I'll do it through a chat facility. Mm -hmm. But if you do want to make it um, more interactive, there's two different ways to go about it if you want people to ask questions. I personally would use um, a teleconference line, like mm. I said. And with a teleconference, you can have a facilitator 
there and they can actually control so you can have it on mute for everyone yeah. and then you can ask people to unmute their lines if you want to ask a question by pressing star five for yeah. example if you're That's dealing great. with people turn on their mics and their speakers you're just going to get that noise mm. in the background because a lot of people aren't too savvy with the um, technology that they're using or the other option um, is many organizations out there actually have operator assisted people in here so for AGMs mm. and shareholder announcements what people do they do an operator assisted call or webcast um, so you have someone from the organization in there setting everything up mm -hmm. and people actually say their name when they join the teleconference and then mm -hmm. the speaker speaks and then it, they say if you want to ask a question please press star zero and then the facilitator at the company that you're working with will drag them into that room so you yeah. can have it professionally managed if you do want to do it really professional um, otherwise there are ways that you can manage yourself but there's always options um, I would recommend for this environment always have the chat for people asking questions and then a facilitator like yourself reading it out yeah. Um, but like I said, it's about going to speak to an expert, seeing what they offer, um, making sure they offer support as well, because you don't want to be the person that, you you know, 100 <laughs> people are calling because they can't get on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely um, considering that. Yeah, I agree. Support in a team's a big mm. thing because if you're just running, if you're a one-man band yes. or one-person operation and um, you, you can't, yeah, if you're presenting and then trying to facilitate Put and support. Put it to the company. The you, company should offer that yeah, support. You yeah. shouldn't be, like, you need to focus on getting that message out there, yes. focusing on that because if you're all over the place, then mm. it's just not going to work no. and you won't get the results you're looking for. Definitely not. Yeah. All right, we've got another question. They're all coming through. Mm. Um, so we've got another question from Sanjay. Thanks for your question, Sanjay. With lots of competition in this space, how do you promote your organisation or yourself? And so I think he's probably meaning like, how do you get above the noise? Mm, yeah, yeah, all that noise. And you're probably better. Yeah. <laughs> you do it <laughs> so quite that, well. That, that, that one's for me. Um, what, what I found, Sanjay, is, um, you know, when we've worked in competitive markets, so say, for example, the, the nutrition market. Mm. So most nutritionists would get out there and say, you know, um, you need to eat healthier, you know, eat less, exercise mm. more, yeah. you know, eat the five food groups, the more greens. Old, yeah. so everyone's heard that message so many times. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, if your registration page says, you know, we're going to show you how to eat healthier, people aren't just going to register. Yeah. I mean, the, so you do need to have, um, you know, a little bit of curiosity involved yes. um, in any of the messages that you, you put out there. So when I did some work with a nutritionist two years ago, we did four, um, four massive product launches in one year. And the, the first webinar that we ran was, um, the title was, What in the World is Wrong With Me? Mm. And um, the reason why we came up with that title is because I interviewed the nutritionist and I said, well, what, you've been seeing clients one-on-one -on -one for seven years. Mm. Like, what do they come to you with? And they say, well, everyone says they don't know what's going on with their body. Yeah. And so that, that particular message, that was the one where we got the 8,000 people to come along. Ah. Just because it was, it was based on what people are asking on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So having that, just really understanding what the end user is unsure about mm. or wants more information about and then advertising that through the messaging, that's one way you can stand out from the noise. Yeah, and I think um, once you've done that and the, you've got the people online, respect them and respect their time. And there are a lot of people out there doing it, but not many people are doing it well. And no. I even, I'd go on to your competitors and I'd go register for one of their events. And a lot of the times I, I just, I don't convert. Mm. We're talking about that because mm. I've got to fill out 20 different fields to register for an event. And I'm like, do you know what? Use progressive profiling and mm. capture data at different stages. All I want to do is put my first name, last name, email address and maybe a number yeah because I know there's going to be a call to action <laughs> yeah. um, but at the same time it's like make it easy for me so definitely check out what your competitors are doing listen to what they're doing and do it better agreed yeah all right so I think that's all our calls for the excellent. day excellent and that brings us up to perfect timing another tip never if you are going to go over time always make sure you tell people and respect their time yeah, yeah. agreed Okay, we're one minute to go. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been great. And thanks to everyone else out there. Um, hopefully you've got some great tips. Um, feel free to contact us afterwards if you have any other questions about anything we've spoken about today. But go um, into that resources folder, check out the website, um, and also take a look at the inspirational content that we've got on there. Um, and like I said, if you need anything, feel free to contact us. Um, enjoy your Friday. And don't forget the survey. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. See you later.